good afternoon um, and welcome here. My name is Xander van Eck. I am Dutch. I come from the same country as the paintings. And um, I have been teaching at uh, universities in Amsterdam and Utrecht in art history uh, before I came uh, to Izmir five years ago, where I'm now teaching at Izmir University of Economics. And um, it's a pleasure for me, of course, to be here. I'm very happy that this exhibition is here. Uh, when I used to live in Amsterdam, I saw these paintings almost uh, on a monthly basis. So it's like uh, I am seeing some old friends again. And, um, well, what I want to do today is to give you an idea about how these paintings that you can see in this exhibition were used in the 17th century. And, um, well, one thing that I must say beforehand is that uh, painting, of course, was extremely popular in the 17th century in Holland. And there were um, many painters. At, at, at one moment in Amsterdam, there were certainly more than 100 workshops of professional painters. So there was an enormous competition between those painters, which, of course, this competition resulted in the enormous quality of the best of them. And there was also another kind of competition, because people liked to, uh, liked to buy paintings, and as all their neighbors also bought paintings, there was also a competition there about who could get the, uh, the most beautiful examples. So that also, uh, was, that, that also stimulated the quality of the arts in general. So, well, <coughs> I'm going to talk about some paintings that are now extremely popular and well known, like uh, Rembrandt's Night Watch, there uh, on the left. There is a bit too much light, I think, on the screen. That's better, yes. <coughs> so the Night Watch, uh, which is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, but unfortunately it's too big to fly all the way to Istanbul, so it's still there. And um, the anatomical lesson by Professor Tulp, which is in The Hague in the Mauritshuis Museum. And you can see how popular they are. You know, they've become common knowledge, you could say. The anatomical lesson was used, the, comp the composition at least, in one of the Asterix books. And the Night Watch is so uh, well known in Amsterdam that even football fans, usually not known for their cultural interest, but even they, uh, the Ajax fans, know the Night Watch and they use it to, uh, you know, to make their banners. Now, if you would go today to Amsterdam to see some paintings, let's say, you know, you're interested. Of course, you go to Amsterdam to see many things, but you might want to see some paintings. You go, you take a plane from Istanbul, very easy. Three hours later, you land, you see this view, you fly over the city. And then you go to your hotel, and a few hours later, you are on the museum square, and you can enter the Rijksmuseum. And what you see in there, then, of course, are the famous paintings that you came for. In a crowd, you know, amidst a crowd of tourists, as you see here, children running around. And what you see there is basically the painting as a work of art. But um, what I want to show today is that originally, of course, their art value was important, but they also had another function. They were made for special occasions, for special spaces, for special people. 
and they had their meaning in the cultural environment of that day. So what I want to do is not take you on a touristic trip today in the 20th century or in the 21st century, but in the 17th century. And then, of course, in the 17th century, if we went to Amsterdam from Istanbul, we would not go by plane, but we would go by ship. And this is how we would arrive in the harbor of Amsterdam. So we see the city with the old church here. Oh no, this is, yeah, this is the old church, the new church. And uh, what would be here nowadays is the central station. So we're approaching the city from the north side. And then, um, so basically what we saw was a view from this side, from the A River. And then we uh, step on a smaller boat and we take this canal until we arrive at Dam Square, the central square of the city. So today we will step out of the boat there and visit the town hall and the new church to see paintings. From there we will take a walk over the Singelgracht uh, to here where we will visit a small clandestine Catholic church uh, with a wonderful altarpiece. From there we will go back to the, uh, where is now the Doolen Hotel, uh, but it used to be the um, Kloveniers Doolen, which was the, head, the, the, the headquarters of the city militia, the city guards, the guards of the city. Um, and there is also an important Rembrandt painting there. From there, we will walk to another square, the Neumarkt. There is a building there which is called the Waag, which used to be, uh, in the 17th century, the headquarters of the Surgeons Guild. Surgeons is, um, yeah, well, surgeons, yeah, you can hear that in your translation, of course, what that is. Uh, and from there, we'll go a little bit further to a private house uh, where we will uh, take a look at the paintings there. So it's about, you know, you can make that walk now today, the same, same um, roads, the same canals are still there. And if you would take that walk, it would take you about an hour, just as long as about this lecture would last. So this is where we get out of the boat. By the way, a similar picture, or even the same one, is in the exhibition today here. And uh, so this is what people coming from all over the world arriving in Amsterdam in the 17th century would see when they stepped on land. This enormous town hall, which, is, which looks like a palace. And that is actually why it was built. You know, it was built in 1648, they started it. It lasted seven years to build. And it, they, they started at the end of the year uh, of the war of 80 years against Spain. So Holland had struggled for its freedom for 80 years and then in 1648 finally Holland was recognized as a free republic by Spain. So, and to celebrate that Amsterdam built this enormous town hall. And um, just how enormous it is we can see when we go in there. You can still go in there now. It's, uh, it's a kind of tourist attraction. But in the, uh, in the 17th century, it was also open to the public. And that is reflected in the name of the biggest space in that, inside that town hall. It is um, the Citizens Hall, or the Burgerzaal in Dutch. Well, I can tell you everything about this uh, building, by the way, because in the 1980s, when I was a student of art history in Amsterdam, I was a tour guide here. So I'll just, you know, give a very small piece of information, but if you want to know more after the lecture, you can ask me anything about it. Now, this is uh, the main hall, which we always told to the tourists uh, when we were giving a tour. This, is, uh, as, this hall is as high as a six-story building. You can see it 
throw the measure of the people standing there. And um, I told you the Dutch were fond of paintings and also this building, you know, although it's an official building, it's full of paintings and also very large paintings. But what is important, what is interesting about them is that they tell something about the things that the people working there were doing and about their ideals and their hopes and dreams. This, for instance, is the mayor's chamber, the Belediye Bashkandar. There were four mayors in, uh, in Amsterdam at the same time and they had their meetings in this room. So this was the room from which Amsterdam was governed at the time. Now, you see that there's people uh, running, uh, walking around here. So if the mayors were not having their meetings, people could just come in. And they would see above the chimney this enormously large painting by Ferdinand Boll, uh, which he was one of the most successful pupils of Rembrandt. And, um, and again, when you go there today, it looks almost the same, and the painting is still there. It looks like this. For instance, if you can see the boy sitting here on the stairs, you can also see him here. So that proves to you that, that this is the same painting. But it's still there, as I said. Now, what it shows is the story from Greek and Roman history. So there's a war between uh, a part of Greece and Rome. And this shows a moment where a Roman consul, Consul Fabricius, goes into the army camp of the Greek king Pyrrhus. So this is the Greek king, and this is the Roman consul. And then the Greek king Pyrrhus, he pulls a trick. At a certain moment, he pulls away uh, a carpet, and from behind that carpet comes an elephant, a screaming elephant. Of course, the idea is to scare him, scare the Roman consul, so that he will give up, uh, and, uh, you know, and the Greeks will win the negotiations. But we see how brave and unmoved the Roman consul is. You know, he say, you know, you can throw any elephant at me, I am not scared. And that's, of course, what this is about. So these consuls, the Roman consuls, are the uh, examples for the uh, Amsterdam mayors. So the Amsterdam mayors who were governing Amsterdam at the time were supposed to be just as brave and unmoved as the Roman consul Fabricius was in this picture. Now there was another part of the decoration. There's around this uh, whole building there are large high galleries and at the end of those galleries the city government wanted very large paintings half around from above and these, this is really it's five by five meters, this painting. No, 25 square meters. And there were eight of them. And this one was painted by Jan Lievens, one of Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's uh, best friends. He worked together with him when they were young. What you see here is a story about the Batavians. So all these eight half round paintings in the galleries were about the revolt of the Batavians against the Romans. And of course the Batavians were the people who lived in Holland before the Dutch people lived. You know, they were in, in Roman times the Dutch people were called the Batavians. And so they were very, they were so, um, uh, they were so strong and powerful that they uh, stood up against the Roman Empire. And that of course became a kind of model, a kind of uh, example for the war of the small country, the small republic of Holland against Spain. So this really has to do with the moment that this building was built in 1648 when the peace with Spain was signed. Now, um, I told you Lievens was Rembrandt's friend, 
But Rembrandt himself at that moment, around 1655, was an old man and um, his big successes were over. <coughs> Not because he was a bad painter, of course, he was a genius, but he was a very difficult man. And he blew many of his own chances. And again, so, but they thought, well, you know, let's give the old man one more chance. Let's give him a commission for one of these gallery paintings. He can earn a lot of money. So Rembrandt started to work, and this is the painting that he made, or at least it's part of the painting that he made. It's now, as, I, as you see, in Stockholm, Sweden, in the National Museum. And it's quite big, it's about three meters wide and two meters high, but not enough to fill that five by five space, as you, as you may understand. And I can tell you why that is. So, because this is the original design, the, draw, the drawing that Rembrandt made to prepare for this painting. So, uh, you see the story is again about the Batavians, one important moment of that struggle of the Batavians against the Romans, the conspiracy of Claudius Civilis, and that's this man, and he at that time was the king of the Batavians, and they are somewhere in the, uh, in the woods in Frisia, or the province of Holland, conspiring in the night making plans to beat the Romans. And so one, you know, it's one of my favorite Rembrandt paintings. It's a very late work with very broad brushwork. Very, uh, you know, you can see the paint. It's very thick. The, the, the paint is very thick and uh, very sketchy. And the light effect is extremely spectacular. That's what Rembrandt was, of course, very good at. You know, these spectacular light dark effects. But, uh, as I said, Rembrandt was a difficult person. And um, so what happened was, uh, he finished the painting, the large 5x5 five five painting, and it was put up in the gallery, but the mayors were not happy. So there was something, we don't know exactly what they didn't like, but they were not happy with something. So they asked Rembrandt to take the painting down again and to change something. Well, they shouldn't have done that because that made Rembrandt really mad. So what he did was he took the painting and he cut out the main piece, the most interesting piece, and he sold that to the Queen of Sweden. So that's why it's now in the museum in Stockholm. So now, unfortunately, when you go to the town hall in Amsterdam, this painting is not there. But it could have been there. It's so close. Um, and um, so, you know, just to show you how sorry the Dutch still are, is that they, they uh, organized a few years ago a manifestation where they, uh, with projection of, uh, of uh, let's say, uh, of a kind of um, slide machine uh, video, they try to reconstruct in the gallery how the painting would have looked if it was there at the place that it was going to. But, you know, you see that this is a mirage, this is a dream which will never come true. So what they did here was actually the same that I did here, so they combined the drawing and blew it up and put in the part uh, that now is the painting. So there would be much more paintings to talk about in the town hall, but we only have an hour. So we go outside again to Dam Square. And Dam Square, of course, there are more important buildings. And the second important building here is the Nieuwe Kerk, the new church. And it was built in the Middle Ages, but uh, when Holland became Protestant, when Amsterdam became Protestant in 1578, this church, uh, this church was seized by the Protestants. So from then on, uh, it remained a Protestant church. And of course, um, what we know from Protestant churches 
is that just like in, uh, uh, in Islamic mosques, there are supposed to be no paintings because the Protestants thought that it is wrong to admire you know, images. That was one of their reasons to separate from the Catholic Church. But, you know, the, the Dutch love painting so much. So this is, uh, by the way, again, this building is still there, the new church. And this is now a kind of, uh, it isn't used as a church anymore, but it's an uh, exhibition hall. So there's now, at the moment of this photograph, there's also an exhibition about world nature art. Anyway, but when you go in, you can still see some parts of the interior that are intact. And you see the 17th century organ, and that is painted with a large scene by an Utrecht painter, who, who, uh, his name is Jan van Bronckhorst, his name you can forget, he's not very important. But um, a great scene of the triumph of King David from the Old Testament. So that's, you know, that's what I want to show you, that even though actually there were not supposed to be any pictures, you know, the, the Dutch loved pictures so much that they found a place, you know, the organ is a rather innocent place to make a picture. So uh, there they found an excuse. Well, um, this is uh, our end of the trip to, to Dam Square and its building. So the next building that I promised to go to uh, is here on the map. So we walk from here um, along the uh, Nieuwezijds Voorburgwaal to the Single Gracht. The Single, or also the, the in, in the 17th century they called it the, the King's Canal. And there we see a house that looked about like this, you know, a very typical Amsterdam canal house. So when you would go in, you know, when you ring the bell there, you expect, you know, that somebody who lives there opens the door. But that's not true, because inside that house is a clandestine Catholic church. So we have this idea of Holland in, or the Republic in the 17th century as a Protestant country, and everybody's Protestant, but that's not true because about 30% of the population remained faithful to the Catholic Church. But they were not allowed to have, you know, to live their religion in the open. So what they did was they made secret churches inside of houses. And there were about 25 of these in Amsterdam. And they were, as you see, they were rather big, you know, this is, uh, people are this size, so, you know, it's again, it's, uh, you know, what they did was they, they broke through the ceilings of that old house and made one space out of three floors so that it could hold a few hundred people that would come there to visit mass on Sundays. So here you see the altar, of course, the center of the uh, Catholic religion. And um, above that altar, there, was, there were actually three different pictures available that they would change, you know, according to the time of year. And this is one of them. Uh, I have the name of the painter as well. So he was a Flemish painter from the school of Rubens. But the Jesuits, you know, the, um, the, who, who were in that church, who were leading that church, had lots of connections in, uh, in Antwerp, so they asked this Antwerp painter to paint an altarpiece for their clandestine church in Amsterdam. And you see this is, you know, very, a very Catholic, very un-Protestant painting with a saint here kneeling and have a, having a vision of Holy Mary with the Christ child. So, although from the outside uh, Amsterdam looked like you know a Protestant uh, city, if you could go, if you would go in, inside one of those clandestine churches, you would be in a different world, and um, you would be able to express your uh, your devotion and your Catholic religion 
just like nothing uh, happened. And actually, I say they are secret churches, but of course there were 25 of these big house, you know, house churches in Amsterdam, and of course the police knew where they were. But they, um, they had a kind of agreement that uh, every church had to pay a certain amount of money, 500 guilders about every year, and then they would be left alone. As long as they didn't show anything on the outside. So this, oh yeah, I also did this trick, yeah. So of course this is a drawing of the interior but combining it with the painting and unfortunately these paintings were sold in 1968 only so very short time ago this church still had its own paintings and then they you know the roof was leaking and they had to pay you know they, they were short of money so they sold this and this is now in a museum in Indianapolis in the United States. Now, not so far from the Singel and this clandestine church, we turn around to another canal, which is called the Kloveniersburgwal. I won't ask you to repeat that. Um, and the, but it was, it was called after the Kloveniers, and the Kloveniers were one of the city militia. So they were the guards who were supposed to def defend the city when they were attacked. So they had their guns, and um, so now you see uh, at, this, at the place where their building was is now the Doolen Hotel, and Doolen is Dutch for targets, so they were practicing on targets. So there's still a relation with this hotel and the original function of that building, which looked like this at the time. You, know, you can see this, this round tower here, which is still uh, coming back. In that, uh, in that hotel building. So this tower there is in the same place. Of course, the building it's, you know, was replaced in the 19th century, renewed. But um, as I said, you know, these militia, what they were doing was practice there, but also, um, well, Amsterdam, to be honest, was not attacked you know, on a regular basis. So these guilds of militiamen, like the Cloveniers, they were also a kind of, uh, let's say, clubs for rich men. So they, they would have, have their fun together, and they would shoot together, and they would never have to fight, basically. But what they did do was come together often and have big dinners, etc. And if you see, I've, sometimes, I've, I've seen you know, the lists of, of meat and beer and wine that they consume. Sometimes they have parties of three days where they ate 60 pigs and uh, you know, uh, 20, they drank 20 barrels of wine and not to speak about the beer and the cows and whatever. So that was the main function and that's what, why they had this building which had a great dining hall And again, this dining hall, as you can see, was full of paintings. So there's a large portrait here. And of course, uh, these portraits, the group portraits of these uh, militiamen, were always you know, the, the most important men from those clubs together. So there's one here above the chimney, one here, one here, one here, and one here. So there's, you know, even on the part of this uh, print that you can see, there's already five very large group portrait paintings. Now, and the one above the chimney is uh, at the Rijksmuseum now, and it's this one. And this is usually how they would look, these group <coughs> portraits. Uh, just, you know, man, well-to-do man, not looking very soldiery, uh, sitting around the table and drinking and conversing. But then they asked in, tw in 1642, one of the companies of that Cloveniers Guild asked Rembrandt to make their portrait, their group portrait, and that was the Night Watch. So this is one of those four paintings that you saw there on the wall. And maybe you can also realize now what a revolutionary painting that already was in that time. You know, if the tradition was 
to have uh, just you know your portraits sitting around the table and he made an action painting out of it so he made the painting of uh, the officers of the guard coming out of the building and you know going off to war with uh, uh, with banners, flags, and uh, loading their guns. There's even uh, one of the girls who is usually behind them, you know, taking care of the food, etc. Uh, maybe also taking care of the men, we don't know that. And uh, drum, you know, drummers. So this is, uh, as I said, a painting full of action, and, and Rembrandt made it into a story. So. Well, you can, you can understand why he made such an impact on the art world of his time. Because he did, well, he basically, he did everything from scratch. He made something completely new that nobody ever had done before. And there's a myth about this painting that, uh, you know, the people who were portrayed on it were not happy with it because it was too dark and because they were not recognizable. But, you know, that's, that is a story that people started to, to tell later on. But we know actually from the 17th century sources that they were, especially the captain was very happy and he uh, asked another painter to make a copy of it for his own family album. Now, um, we arrive at the uh, one but last stop on our tour through Amsterdam. We are now at the so-called Nieuwmarkt, the New Market, a square. And on the middle of that square, you see a building that is obviously very old. Already in the 17th century, it was already an old building. So it was part of the old city walls. So the, the defense works of the city. That's why it looks so strong and castle-like. But uh, in the 17th century, the city had grown much bigger, so this, you know, this had no function anymore as you know, part of the defense works, so because they were much more outside at that time. So this building got another function. As you can see today, it is a cafe, it's, it's an another new function, you can go there inside. But in the 17th century, it was the home of the Surgeons Guild. And um, so what is the word for surgeon in Turkish again? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Uh, thank you. And um, and they had their meeting room there, but not only that, there was also inside an anatomical theater. So what they did, uh, the the medical doctors uh, who were part of that surgeon's guild, one, a few times a year, they gave a demonstration of dissecting a human body. And that's what you see here. This is, not in, this is in Germany somewhere, but you know, this, is, this is how it also went in Amsterdam. I couldn't find a picture of that. And um, they would always use the body of a criminal who was convicted to death, who was hanged uh, a few days before, so they were sinful people, so there was no harm in, in the cutting them up. And, um, but you, you can understand that these, these surgeons who did that, you know, they, had, they were very popular, they were kind of superstars actually. So this is uh, how the anatomical theater inside the building uh, looked in Amsterdam. So this is the actual Amsterdam one, so, and you can still check that if you go into that cafe and you look at the ceiling, you see this. So you can see uh, the family arms of some of the surgeons who were working there painted on the ceiling. But again, um, as I said, in these, uh, there was not just this, this uh, show theater, but also the room, the space where the surgeons came together to have conferences and, of course, meals and drink. And again, there, they would want their own portraits. And that is how the anatomical lesson by Dr. Tulp 
came into existence. So again, I hope you understand that you know this portraits like these were of course not things that Rembrandt, you know, was sitting in his workshop thought, well, let's what shall we paint today, you know. No, that's not how it happened, you know. People came to him and asked him, well, Dr. Tilp, for instance, he said, well, I want you to make a portrait of me and my eight colleagues and students uh, when, you know, at the moment that we are dissecting a body, because that's what we do. So Rembrandt may, might have been a genius, but again here you see that the, um, the restrictions with, uh, that he had while he was working were rather big. So it depended often on, on what people asked him to do, what he made, and then he found a creative solution. <coughs> but I said, you know, there were uh, about a hundred or, or more painters even at the same time working in Amsterdam all the time. And they made enormous quantities of paintings. So the estimates about the number, the total number of paintings that were made during the 17th century is somewhere between 5 and 10 million paintings. And of course they couldn't all, they were not all these large things that went into large public buildings. You know, most of these paintings were somewhat smaller and they were bought by private citizens to decorate their homes. And uh, you know, when you walk through the halls of the, uh, of the exhibition here below and you, you look at the, interior, the paintings of interiors of houses, you see that in almost all those paintings there are paintings on the wall everywhere. So um, there's, that's something that foreigners who came to Amsterdam in the 17th century were surprised about. They said, you know, it's so strange that even when you go to the baker or when you go to the butcher, very simple people, but they, even they have art on their walls. Well, that's how much the Dutch love their painting. One of those paintings, by the way, uh, uh, a very interesting example is uh, by Jan Steen. You can see it downstairs of the baker uh, announcing that his fresh bread is ready. By Jan you know, you, maybe you can go back you know, downstairs after the lecture and do that. Um, so, um, there's one house in Amsterdam that I want to focus on and it is again on the Kloveniersburgwal, so a little bit further down the road from the, uh, from the militia building and a little bit further than the Waag at the Newmarkt where we just were. It's this house actually, you can only see it half but it was the only picture that I could find and um, it was the house of Jan Six. And Jan Six was a very cultured man and he was a friend of Rembrandt. And he, you know, he sponsored him sometimes, he gave him loans, etc. So he was from a rich family. And Rembrandt, you know, he, Rembrandt earned a lot of money all the time, but he spent it faster than he could, you know, than he earned it. So that was his problem, or one of his problems. And um, one of the things that Rembrandt did was he made um, a portrait of Jan Six. And if you would go into that house, you would have seen that. And that is, well, if you would ask me, if you would put a gun to my head and ask me what is your favorite Rembrandt, uh, I would say uh, Jan Six portrait. Because it is such, uh, you know, the colors are so wonderful, the clothing, the way it is, uh, but it starts with the face, of course, uh, the psychology uh, of, you know, of that man. You can read so much into that face. Uh, what it is done in a very precise way, so you can recognize him, but it's also done in a very loose way, so that you have enough room for your own interpretation about how he feels. And then if you can see how, uh, how quickly that was painted and how sure his brush strokes are, and for instance, what a, what a feast of color here these uh, uh, gloves are that he is uh, holding. It is, you could say, it's almost impressionist painting before impressionism was invented. 
So, um, so that was, you know, no doubt the most beautiful painting in his house. But in houses like that, as, as I said, there would be much more paintings. So there are no actual pictures of how Jan, uh, Jan Six's house could have uh, looked at that moment on the inside. But as I said, there are many other pictures of interiors from the 17th century. And what you see there is that there are paintings, you know, wherever there was a place for them. So above the window here and there above the door. And often they are landscapes um, like also in this uh, painting by Vermeer. So we're going to make a little excursion now to Delft. Uh, that would take about a day by boat in the 17th century, but you know, we are just, uh, this is a, let's say, a vision of Delft that we have now. And uh, in a picture by Vermeer, the concert, you see that on the wall there is a landscape, but also uh, a painting with persons on it. And we know that Vermeer did not make this painting up. It's not his fantasy. Because his mother-in-law actually owned this painting. So uh, it is a painting by an Utrecht painter, Dirk van Baburen, about the brothel. So it's a kind of naughty subject. So this uh, is the young lady. And this is the old woman who brings the man and the young lady together and gets part of the money. So she's show, showing her hand so, yeah, to say it will cost some money. So these were kind of, as I said, naughty but very popular subjects also for paintings that you could have in your house. So sometimes these uh, paintings that you see in interiors can have uh, a symbolic meaning. For instance, here we see two paintings that belong together. They're exactly the same size and they're still together. They were always sold as a pair and they're exactly, you know, as I said, they, they, they were clearly made to be hung next to each other like this. Because we see a man here writing a letter and we see a woman here who has just received the letter. So we can imagine that that is the same letter. And that it is, um, has to do with, some, that it has something to do with love, we can infer from the picture that the maid is revealing here. We see a ship on a stormy sea, which is of course a metaphor for the love of these young people. So, um, this is a kind of, as I said, you know, these smaller paintings with popular subjects, not too difficult. You know, uh, in homes, you would not see uh, lots of paintings about Roman consuls and Greek kings, etc. No, just like, for instance, you know, what you would like to have in your house. It would be still lifes with recognizable pieces of food and drink, or a landscape that re reminds you of the landscape around your city or uh, the sea, uh, or scenes of everyday life, like this painting by uh, Jan Steen. And as I said, the, the format of these paintings was much smaller than the ones that you would see in, um, in public buildings. Now, uh, I, there's one category that I didn't talk about yet, and one, thi one uh, well, I did talk, I, I, I showed you the painting of Jan Six, the portrait of Jan Six, and what you would see in uh, houses of fairly rich private citizens, of course, would always be family portraits. And one of them can be seen at this exhibition, the portrait of, of Haasje van Kleiburg, uh, that um, Rembrandt started his career with. And this is the kind of paintings that he became rich with. And this is, of course, what takes us back from uh, 17th century Amsterdam to the here and now of the, uh, the Sabanji Museum <laughs> and uh, also to the end of this lecture. Thank you very much.
So, if there are any questions. We've got some time left. I thought I would take an hour, but it's only 45 minutes. Yes? I have actually many questions. Yes. Uh, to start with the conspiracy of cloud civilists. Yes. By the government or by the uh, commission givers? Yes. <coughs> um, is that because the appearance of the king? I mean, there are, I read some speculations about it, but I wonder your idea. Yes. Um, the appearance of the king? Yes. Uh, the, one of the theories is um, as you say, you're right, that. Um, people found the, the face of this king offensive because, you know, he was blind. You know, we know from the history books, or Rembrandt already knew from the history books, that he was blind on one eye. And, uh, but Rembrandt shows his face from, you know, frontally, so that we can see that, uh, that bad eye. And that was, you know, nobody did that before. But Rembrandt, as I said, Rembrandt always, you know, did something new and, and something unexpected. So he showed the full, dis, you know, deformed face of that king. So that might have been a reason. I don't think that's true. Uh, I think, you know, the Amsterdam mayors could, you know, they could, uh, they could have a kind of, um, let's say, uh, they wouldn't mind that. You know, there, there, it was, it, they were hard times as well in the 17th century. I don't think they would have objected to these kind of realistic details. Um, another theory that I have more belief in is um, that actually, you know, the figures uh, were rather small in connection to the enormous surface of this painting. So when you were standing down on the floor and looking up to that painting, you would see these very little puppets and uh, with lots of space around it. So what I think is that the mayor thought, well, you know, he could add some extra and some bigger figures to make the painting more attractive. But we will never know the real answer, probably, because, you know. In the context of art philosophy, uh, which questions we must ask uh, about art philosophy? Uh, which questions we must ask uh, about art um, Well, I don't, I don't know if there is a rule for that. Uh, I don't think there is a rule. Um, but uh, what you see is that the questions that we ask about Rembrandt are always different. You know, it, they, they belong to the period in which we live. For instance, in the 19th century, everybody was obsessed with genius. So they were uh, interested in answering the question, what was the genius of Rembrandt? Why was he a genius? In the 20th century, and especially the second half of the 20th century, uh, we became more interested in uh, asking questions about the context. So like, you know, the things that I have been talking about now. So who were the people who paid him? Uh, what did they want from, ha from, the, from him? And how did he react to that? Um, and, um, well, actually art philosophy, of course, is something different than, than art history. I'm an art historian, so art philosophy, uh, you must ask somebody else. Huh? Or, yeah, well, you know, there would, of course, I have often said that I would give uh, 10 years of my life for just five minutes uh, with Rembrandt, uh, just asking him what he found important. But, of course, that's what we always uh, want to know. What did he, what was his uh, uh, vision? What did he want to do? Um, he had great em empathy with people. Yes, that is, uh, that there, but there's a strange thing about Rembrandt. When you look at his paintings, you think he understood people and he had great empathy and feeling for them. But if you read in the archives about what he did to his friends and his wives, 
then you think, well, you know, maybe he wasn't so good on the empathy department, you know. For instance, uh, he, when uh, his, his first wife, Saskia, died in 1642, the same year as the Night Watch, and then Rembrandt started to live with his, with his housemaid, Geertgen Dirks. And um, we know from the archives that she, at a certain moment, uh, said that she, you know, she had a right to marry him because they were sleeping together, which was obviously true. But then he fixed that by having her uh, sent to the madhouse, where she spent the rest of her life. So he wasn't a very nice man. But apparently that's not necessary to, you know, to make very beautiful paintings. And maybe there is a difference between reflecting the feelings to the paintings and really feeling them inside. Yes, we can, we can, yeah. We can draw that kind of conclusions, yeah, yeah. And I really wonder something. Uh, what, what did other um, humanists or art historians in 17th century about uh, Dutch genre painting, for example, young stains, uh, really inappropriate scenes mm -hmm. of inns and, for example, Emmanuel de Witte's market scene. For yes. Example. I mean, like, unimportantly, seeming unimportant scenes, what would they think? I mean, because they, they don't look very high subjects. No, they are, of course, they are low subjects. The, 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 you know, they are called low genre, actually, in, in, our, uh, in our profession. And, well, um, it was not high art, so actually, uh, that is one of the big problems that we have, is that very little was written about it. So humanists were not really, they were humanists, you know, the, the scholars who knew Latin and Greek, they were writing about higher subjects like, you know, consuls and kings. But these everyday scenes and landscapes, you know, they didn't really care about them. And they maybe didn't even see them as art because they were too simple. But the funny thing is, of course, that those things, those still lives and those scenes of everyday life have always remained recognizable for us. You know, they give us a chance to place ourselves in the shoes of the people in the 17th century. So, um, they, so they now are our image of what is interesting about the 17th century art. But, um, yeah, well, it is a big problem to, to uh, you know, um, to find out what the theory behind those paintings was. And maybe the most simple thought is there was not so much theory. You know, it was just subjects that people liked to have in their house. And, you know, as good, you know, as well painted as possible. So there were actually very sophisticated collectors who bought the best painted low genre paintings. And they already valued them as works of art, but because of their technique, more than of their subject. Yes. When, when, did, when did they become valuable? I'm sorry. <laughs> I wonder. Um, did they seen as precious works of art in the history of art? Um, well, um, in basically in the 18th century, people from, uh, from France and Germany uh, start collecting them. The princes and, and uh, rich people from Paris you see big collections that are interested in these uh, because they offer an alternative to the official French art and are, you know, attractive. Sir? Microphone. My question is about architecture. Mm -hmm. The town hall, the facade put in the plaza, Yes. Yes. Because of the system of the windows. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's the facade. Yes. It's actually two story Yes. The plastic on floor. Now, the question is whether the same system is valid throughout the whole building. Um, on the 
Yes, it basically is, looks the same. All, all, the, 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 all the four facades have the same, uh, uh, the same division. Same division? Yes. But does it mean that you have all the two stories from the norm? Uh, well, um, I showed you uh, the, uh, the painting of the Burgemeester, the mayor's room, and that is here. Yes. Sir. So, yes. that is these three windows. So, that's one story. But the Burgersaal, this large hall, is actually inside, covers the whole two stories. So, and, and here, this, by the way, is interesting. This was the so called uh, Vierschaar. Somewhat, uh, there were no windows here. And the Vierschaar was the place where the death sentences were spoken. So, that had to be in direct connection with the square. So, when the death sentences were spoken, uh, then after that, you know, the, the prisoner was taken outside and there was a kind of uh, uh, place here with the gallows and they, they were killed there right after. This is the tour guide speaking again, of course. Uh, you said that some of the paintings inside the uh, houses are just made because people uh, wanted them to yes. their houses. Mm -hmm. Uh, can we really say that uh, symbolism applies throughout the whole period of uh, 17th century Dutch art? Because oh, yeah. that's what we say in the gallery downstairs. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, as you may, uh, as you may um, have heard, this has been a discussion uh, that was very lively uh, in the last half century. And, um, it started with uh, some exhibitions uh, in the 1970s and 60s by one of my teachers, Eddie de Jong. So he was, uh, he was the professor who was trying to reconstruct the symbolic messages that were connected to these paintings. And um, he has been criticized in the decades after, but what, at least what he made us realize, of course, is that these pictures, for instance, these uh, paintings of everyday life, yeah, like, oh, again, we have a little bit too much light here. Uh, so you see here fighting man and uh, you know fighting man and a man uh, embracing a woman and a girl. So there are, of course, um, references to stories that people told each other at that time. So uh, there is you know you cannot completely understand them unless you learn a lot about what people said to each other in the 17th century, what kind of uh, stories they told each other. And um, so that is a lot of the research that, that we've done. But, you know, how, you know, the, the most of the discussion is about how, uh, how serene, how severe these subjects were. Uh, so everybody realizes that we have to know the culture of the 17th century to be understanding what these people are doing. But uh, the moral question about whether this is uh, supposed to make people laugh or whether it is a kind of sermon about how people should behave, that is what we're talking about now. Yeah? <laughs> the lady uh, there on the... So do you think there was any connection with... Um, so, going back to what you were saying before about the production of low art, do you think there was any connection between Protestantism well, uh, very indirectly, because the funny thing is that this kind of market situation uh, of you know where wealthy citizens buying lots of paintings with paintings of daily life, etc., we see that for the first time in Antwerp in the 16th century, and there you know basically it looks a little bit different, but the, the subjects are exactly the same. So that's Peter Bruegel, etc. That's where it begins, and that's in a Catholic context. And then, uh, you know, all these painters through the wars are chased to Harlem and Amsterdam uh, at the end of the 16th century. And then they, they keep on painting the same things, but then they are bought by 
northern Dutch people who are often Protestant. So there is no direct situation, but there is a direct connection between being Protestant and liking certain subjects. We've also uh, done research into the archives of uh, all the people who lived in, in the canal houses in Amsterdam. And we know whether they were Catholic or Protestant. And there's virtually no difference in the kind of paintings that they collected. So, there's your answer. <laughs> there's some more questions here at the front. No, 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 anytime. I'll go on as long as you want. Maybe we should give other people the chance to go. Yes. yes. about the relationship of symbolism and mm. those paintings, especially yes. in uh, Vermeer's and many more. Yes. And uh, I wonder what do you think about the relationship of Andalus and the painters' approach to their own paintings? Uh, what the, was the effect of Andalus? Uh, I think Andalus books are much overrated as a source for painters. Uh, so uh, there are, you know, Emblem books are very intellectual, very humanistic, and um, there, you know, that was also a very popular sport in the 1970s to find connections between emblems and genre paintings. But um, there are really no more than three examples of actual paintings where you can say, yeah, well, this comes from an emblem book. I can't name them. I'm sorry. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> but, uh, what, uh, what can we say about the symbolism? Because everywhere, it's, for example, uh, I can name the name of the book uh, Fuchs. Yes. And uh, Simon Schama. Yes. Shama, yes. They are all talking about the symbolism. Yes. Um, yeah, well, uh, of course, for instance, if you see. Uh, an old man with, uh, with uh, a basket of eggs and you see he, he's dropping his eggs and his eggs are all, uh, are, are all on the floor and they break. Mm -hmm. This is uh, you know, a symbol for uh, his loss of sexual power. Really? For instance, yes. But how do you, because everyone is asking, I'm the uh, guy of this uh, exhibition, yes. so I'm studying all the time, I have to study this. Yes. And uh, I, they ask me all the time where this symbolism is coming from. Okay. Um, well, I can give you some better books than uh, okay. Fuchs and Schama. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, shall we wrap it up? Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>